What a blessing to gather on the first day of the week and worship our good God. He alone deserves the praise and honor that we give on a day like today. As we begin, let's quote our theme verse from the year. And last week, I did not put it on the screen, and you did so well. I'm not going to put it on the screen this week either. Psalm 77, 11. I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your wonders of old. We've been remembering this year. And today's lesson is, is related to last week's lesson. We talked about a forgotten practice, the practice of confessing sin. And today we're going to talk about really a teaching, a doctrine that falls behind that practice and other practices of righteousness, as Alan read for us, in order to be the people of God that he would have us to be, we have to train. Now, somewhere along the way, we've adopted this idea, and I, I don't know that anyone taught it. I don't know that anyone intended to, to give us this thought. But we've adopted this idea that if we want to be good Christians, we just have to try hard. But you know, that doesn't work in most any other area of life. We've got people in this audience who are mechanics, who repair trailers. We've got people who worked on assembly lines, who delivered mail. We've got people who've taught school. We've got people who engineered printers. None of you got into those places merely by trying hard, and you certainly didn't stay in those places merely by trying hard. Instead, you had to train in order to achieve your goal. Why is it any different when we talk about being the people that God would have us to be? Paul says bodily training is of some value. If I take care of my body, if I, if I go to the gym or if I run and I, and I curate and watch what I eat, my diet, there's some, some value in that. But there is far more value in training for righteousness. In training to be the person that God would have me to be in this life. And so as we think about training... I want to notice uh, three things that are going to help us. Three things that we must understand if we're to train for righteousness. And the first one is, God made us. Open your Bibles to Psalm 139. Psalm 139. This is a psalm of David in which David describes the Lord's presence and the Lord's knowledge. Psalm 139 begins, O Lord, you have searched me and known me. And you come down and he says in verse 7, Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? So this is a psalm about God's presence. His omnipresence is the term that is often used. That is, He is present everywhere. And his knowledge, his omniscience, that is, that he knows all. And as David develops this idea that God is present everywhere and he knows all things, he applies that to his mother's womb. In verses 13 through 16, he says, For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. Notice verse 15. My frame was not hidden from you. When I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth, your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. God knew us before we were born, and He made us. You see, there is this question that has been around for a very long time. Who am I? 
And for the Christian, the answer ought to be very clear. I am a person made by God, known by God, in His image, for His glory. And if I know that, then I have a goal. I have a purpose. But, but notice what David says. Not only that God made him, but God saw what he could be. God knew before you or I were born what our strengths and our weaknesses would be. And He gives us the opportunity to develop those strengths and to overcome those weaknesses. And so we train to be the people God would have us to be because He knows our potential. And by His Word by what He has revealed to us, and by what He has done for us in Jesus Christ, we have the opportunity to reach that potential. And so we understand God made us, but there's something more than just that. Turn in your Bibles to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, where we will be looking at verses 14 through 17. It is not just that God made each and every one of us and knows our strengths and our weaknesses. He knows what talents He has given to us on loan. They do not belong to Him. uh, They belong to Him. The most excellent singer on the face of the earth received that gift from God and ultimately it is His gift. And we could go down the line of any talent and say those things are merely on loan from God. But not only are we made by God in the flesh with our physical weaknesses and strengths and abilities, but those of us who are present today who belong to the body of Christ, who have been washed in the blood of Christ, who have obeyed the gospel, have been remade by God. And so Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5 beginning at verse 14, the love of Christ controls us. Because we have concluded this, that one, that is Christ, has died for all, and therefore all have died. We have died to the old person. Jesus says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. We have died to the old person. And he died, verse 15, for all, that those who live might no longer live for themselves, but for him who for their sake died and was raised. We live in a culture that says, be yourself. Do what makes you happy. But Paul says, those who have died with Christ no longer live for themselves, but for him, that is Christ, whose sake, for whose sake, for our sake, was di- died and was raised. Verse 16, From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh. We regard Him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. When we obey the gospel, when we believe that Jesus is the Christ, and we turn away from sin, and we confess the name of Christ, and we're buried in water for the forgiveness of sins, the old person dies in that water with Christ. We're buried with Christ, just as He died and was buried, and God resurrects us to new life. He makes us new in Jesus Christ. Now here's the question that I have. If we've been made new, why do we still struggle with sin? Because we all do. There's no Christian who has perfectly overcome their weaknesses. Who has perfectly resisted the temptations that come before them. And that is why. Even though God made us and He knows our potential and He has remade us in Jesus Christ, it is not sufficient for us to merely try, but we must train. We must train for righteousness. We must have a plan on how we can grow in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord in our lives. And so having understood that, I want to notice what is our example? 
If you want to learn how to do something today, if you want to train for something today, how are you going to do that? When, our, uh, when we found out several years ago that we were going to get a Boston Terrier puppy, I decided that I was going to correct some mistakes. You see, I had potty trained my father-in-law's dog. He was a gift, a, a, a surprise Christmas present, and I had potty trained that dog, but I never had dogs before. And so I was really just trying to train that dog, and I made quite a few mistakes. And so before we got our Boston Terrier, but we knew that he was going to be coming to our house, I bought a book on how to train a dog. And today, if I wanted to do some project in my house, there are not many things that I could do, but I would probably watch a YouTube video on how to do that project in the house. All of those things come back to seeking out the example of someone who has gone before and knows how to do these things. And when we talk about training to be like Christ, there is no greater example and authority than Christ Himself. And so we saw, first of all, God made us, but second of all, we see Jesus is our model for righteousness. Jesus is our model. He is the one to whom we look as we make a plan for growing in the grace and knowledge of the Lord. Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, Be imitators of me as I am of Christ. Now, if Paul says to the Corinthians, you imitate me in so far as, in the ways that I imitate Christ, what must the Corinthians have known? They must have known Christ. You cannot imitate someone if you don't know them. We cannot imitate Jesus if we do not know what He was like. When I was a child, there was this very popular phrase. Everybody had these bracelets and they said, what would Jesus do? And that's a great thought. But a, an equally, if not more important thought is, what did Jesus do? We've got to be familiar with who Jesus is and what He did and why He did it if we can imitate, in order to be able to imitate Him. I might have known that someone was a great carpenter, but I couldn't become anywhere near like them unless I first observed their actions. And so if we want to be like Jesus, if we want to train, we've got to know Him. And the only way that we can know Him is by studying our Bibles, is by reading our New Testaments and our Old Testaments which prophesy about the Christ. And so if we want to be like Christ, if we want to look to Him as a model, we've got to study the Scriptures. And as we study them, we've got to say, what is Jesus doing and why did He do these things? But we've also got to ask this, how? How did Jesus become Jesus? Now that's an odd question to ask, isn't it? How did Jesus become Jesus? We believe that there is one God. And the one God is God the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. They are equal and eternal. And that's a mystery. I cannot explain to you how there's one God in three persons, but I believe that it is so. And I'm not asking how God the Son came to be because God the Son, Father, and Spirit is and always has been and always will be. But I'm asking how did Jesus, God in the flesh, come to be? That is an equal mystery that Jesus was both fully God, 100% God and 100% human. And He became human. He took, took on flesh for us, so that He could be the perfect sacrifice for us. But I cannot explain how He was both fully God and fully man. But when we look at Him from the human side, we can see that Jesus grew. Luke chapter 2 verse 52 says, He grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God. How did God grow in favor with God? 
Well, he grew in favor with God, not merely as God, but as God in the flesh by repeatedly obeying. And he never, he never failed to obey. But when we look at the life of Jesus... I think it's easy for us to assume that he was born perfectly mature. And by that I mean that all that we see him doing in his ministry, he was capable of doing as a child. That his knowledge of the scriptures was implanted in his brain, his physical brain when he was born. But if you'll recall, just a few weeks ago we studied that servant song that's found in Isaiah 50. And verse 4 says, the Lord taught me day by day. And Luke 2 says he grew. So how was Jesus able to quote scripture when he was tempted by the evil one in Luke 4 and Matthew 4? Well, it seems to me he must have put in the work to memorize that scripture. And so when we look at the life of Jesus and we observe the things that he did, we can see him going away to pray. Why did he need to pray? He was God, but he was also in the flesh. And so he spoke to his father. We can see him fasting. We can see him teaching. We can see what he did in order to be who He was in the flesh. Philippians 2 says He emptied Himself. He humbled Himself. Even to the point of death. Death on a cross. And so if we want to grow, if we want to train, if we want to be like Christ, we have to know who He was and how He became who He was in the flesh. And ultimately how He was able to give His life on the cross for us. But not only that, we have to understand the purpose of training. Alan read that passage for us from 1 Timothy chapter 4. I'd like to look at a related one in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 through 27. 1 Corinthians 9, 24 through 27. It's very easy to think about training in the athletic realm. Nobody arrives at the Olympics and is able to do the things that they do without having first trained. And so Paul uses yet another athlete's uh, image in 1 Corinthians 9. He says, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable one. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline, that is, I train my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. There are things that we can do in the flesh to train ourselves, not to win a race, but to be more like God. Now we've got to understand what that means. We talked last week about one of those things, confession, and we explained that it is not something we do to earn God's grace, but it is a response to the grace of God in Christ. But in doing these things, we grow. We become more like Christ. And as Paul writes there, he's not talking about a sprint. He's talking about a marathon. I have known many wonderful Christians who have grown. Who, as a young child, I was able to look to these people who were older than me, not necessarily old, but older than I was, and be able to say, one day I would like to be where they are in my walk with God. They did not get there by accident. And they understood that their walk with Christ was not a sprint, but a marathon. When I was playing football, I was pretty good at sprints. But I didn't play soccer because I couldn't run for 20 minutes uninterrupted. The Christian walk is not a sprint. You can't just show up and automatically be able to be like Christ. It requires training and planning and dedication, committed effort. See, we have these things that we do. We gather on the first day of the week and we sing and we pray. And throughout the week, we know that we ought to study our Bibles 
And we ought to meditate. And we ought to encourage one another. We know that we ought to do these things. And if we do these things, we can grow. If we imitate the actions of Jesus, we can grow. But we've got to understand, there is a difference between going through the motions and growing through the motions. And it comes down to our attitude and our heart. In the Bible reading that we're doing together as a congregation. In the past week, we read the book of Hosea, and so I invite you to turn to Hosea chapter 6. This is probably the most well-known passage in the book of Hosea, and I'm using it because of its application to this lesson, because I, I would have loved to have spent more time in that book with you here in the pulpit. But in Hosea chapter 6, God tells the people, you've been going through the motions. You haven't, you've been offering these sacrifices... But they're meaningless. He says, beginning at verse 4, What shall I do with you, O Ephraim? That is, the most prominent tribe in Israel. What shall I do with you? And what shall I do? That's the northern kingdom. Then he says, What shall I do with you, O Judah? That is, the southern kingdom. Your love is like a morning cloud, like the dew that goes away early. It's temporary. You're not committed to me. Therefore, I have hewn them by the prophets. I have slain them by the words of my mouth, and my judgment goes forth as the light, the them being the tribes. He says in verse 6, For I desire steadfast love, that is a committed love, and not sacrifice, the knowledge of God, rather than burnt offerings. Now God is not saying, to the children of Israel, I want you to cease worshiping me. I want you to cease bringing your offerings. I want you to cease making your sacrifices. He's saying, I want you to grow through the motions, not just go through the motions. The Living Bible translation says, I don't want your sacrifices, I want your love. In other words, the sacrifices ought to be a sign of the relationship that the children of Israel had with God. When we do these things in imitating Christ, when we confess our sins, when we pray, when we study the Scriptures, we're not doing these things to go through the motions. We're doing these things to grow in our relationship with God. If I show up on Sunday morning and I worship God, but my heart is not in it, I have gained nothing. But if I come to this place because I want to give God the glory He deserves because I love Him and I know that He alone is worthy of my praise, then I can grow. And that is the difference. Because I can leave here and I could say, man, that was a waste of time. The sermon may not be what I want it to be. The singing may not be what I want it to be. The prayer may not be the way that I would have led it. But I can still grow if I'm here for God. But if I'm here just to check off a box, just to go through the motions, I leave unchanged. It's not enough just to try. We understand that. Uh, uh, uh. I've been trying to lose weight for several months, but I haven't had a plan. I haven't had a real goal, so I haven't succeeded. It's not enough just to try to be a good Christian. We've got to have a true goal. We've got to have a plan, a commitment, a training and then we can grow. It's not something we talk about often because it seems too formal that we would have a plan to be more like Christ. But we've been studying on Wednesday nights methods of evangelism and something that's come up over and over and over again is a failure to plan is a plan to fail. And we can't grow in the likeness of Christ if we don't have a plan. It's not that I have to follow a specific regimen, but I need some plan if I'm going to succeed. Maybe you want to be made new in Jesus Christ this morning. We said God made each and every one of us. He knows us all. 
And for those of us who are Christians, he has remade us. You haven't experienced that yet. God doesn't promise that from the moment that he remakes us that things are going to be easy, that we're never going to sin again, but we're no longer fighting the battle on our own. If you want to obey the gospel this morning, we're going to sing an invitation song. If you believe that Jesus is the Christ and you're ready to leave sin behind, to confess Christ as Lord and be baptized for the forgiveness of sins, we'll be glad to assist you. If you're a Christian and you need to respond this morning, this invitation is for you as well. It is not our invitation. It is the Lord's invitation to all who would come to Him by the means that He has defined. Please come as we stand and sing together.